This week on True Crime Travelers. So between November 1st and December 31st, 2023, there were eight suspicious deaths of American men in Medellin, Colombia. Welcome to True Crime Travelers, where we investigate suspicious murders and disappearances around the world, but from a traveler's perspective. We are Alexa and Amelia, award-winning travel experts and the authors behind the Solo Girls Travel Guide book series. We are obsessed with safety and true crime, but I promise we're not here to scare you. We're here to prepare you. Okay, question for you, Amelia. You are an international solo traveler. You're Mexican. You've traveled your country extensively, working on marine projects in Baja Sur. You've worked for a nonprofit in the jungles of the Amazon rainforest. You traveled to Bali alone. You drove a tuk-tuk across Sri Lanka as a photojournalist. And now you live on a whole new continent. You live in Spain. You do it. You've been around the world. Why does your face look like you're so icked out? Oh, I'm not. I'm just like fascinated to see like where you're going with this. Okay. So where I'm going with this is you are an international solo female traveler. How many times has someone warned you that the world is dangerous or told you that it isn't safe to travel alone as a woman, that you're going to get drugged, robbed, or kidnapped? How many times? Honestly, I have no idea how many because it's been too many to count. Mm -hmm. Like every time I have traveled either alone or even not, not alone, people are like, what? You're crazy. Like that's too dangerous. I mean, driving a tuk-tuk through Sri Lanka, I was with my boyfriend and everyone was still like, you guys are crazy. And then when I was working for a non-for-profit in Peru, like in the jungle, my dad was like super paranoid of like, you're going to like run across meth cartels in the jungle. And when I went to Bali alone and Bali is like so safe, so many friends were like, you are going alone? Like, why are you going alone? It's like, right. because I want to. Right. So now here's another question for you. Why don't they warn men about kidnappers and robbers and being drugged? They should really start warning men, right? Yeah. And with our travel guides, I, people ask me often, like, why do you niche down on women? Why do you create travel guides for women? And my response is always because women have to think about things that men don't when it comes to traveling. Right. You know, and traveling with my boyfriends, there have been moments that I'm like, oh, like maybe thinking about the sketchy alleyway. And sometimes he's like, I would have never thought of that. Isn't that funny? I actually, um, when now that I travel with my boyfriend sometimes, I do tell him like, I do things with you I would have never done alone. Like I would never have yeah, gone into some random man's house maybe. Oh, that's not true. I do that alone. But anyways, in general, women travel different than men right? First of all, we we, have to, we have to. And us women are taught very strict rules from a very young age, but not just about traveling. Really. We're taught strict rules about even stepping outside of our own front door. Watch your drink at a bar. So you don't get drugged. Beware of men being too friendly. They might be sex traffickers. If you're held at gunpoint, never move to a second location. Do you know that one, Emmy? Oh no. (gasps) Oh my gosh. We are taught in, I mean, at least I remember being taught this growing up, never allow yourself to be taken to a second location. So if someone, um, I don't know, you're getting in your car at a parking lot in the grocery store parking lot and some guy gets in the car and is like, I'm going to shoot you. If you don't drive, you say, you shoot me right here because he's less likely to hurt you in that first location. In the second location, you're not coming back from the second location. So anyways, <laughs> does that make sense? Yeah, it does make sense. I'm just yeah. bewildered by the fact that I'm from Sinaloa and everyone is like, oh, your home is so dangerous, but they don't teach us that stuff. You know, it's like well, no I'm, one has felt yeah. the need to teach me that stuff. Right, right. So, well, I mean, the cartel is like the big scary thing in Mexico. And for us, our scary people are like all around us all day, every day. So it's a little bit different. I don't think people understand that. Like, whatever, we'll do Mexican tangents later. But my point being, us women, we live our day-to-day lives so paranoid about safety. But men, they should really warn men in the same way. Because in some places in the world, 
criminals have no interest in us women, Emmy. In some places in the world, it's men are the target. But men are the target of who? Women. Very sneaky women. So on today's episode, in order not to perpetuate the myth that the world only targets women and to also spread safety awareness to our male travel friends, today, unfortunately, our victim is a man, a man who disappeared in Medellin, Colombia. Emmy, have you ever heard of the term passport bros? No, <laughs> no. Okay. This is actually like kind of a new term because, you know, like I, I'm at the age, I'm 36, you're 34, 35. Four. Yeah. Four. And we're not really on TikTok that much. Like we're on Instagram and we see the TikToks on Instagram, but apparently I think there's a lot of slang that we miss out on, on TikTok. And one of them is passport is passport bros. And I think it's like, kind of like the dudes we know in Bali that are like, I don't Keep know. Like the TikTok- bros. What? Like the crypto bros kind of guy? Yeah, yeah, probably like that. Like, I live, I live a lavish life. I'm just assuming, right? But lately, a lot of passport bros have been getting in trouble in Colombia. They've been traveling there for a while, <laughs> these passport bros, and the locals have become very skilled at setting up scams and traps for unsuspecting tourists. Most of them, almost all of them, honestly, I'm just going to go ahead and say all of them, men. Many of these guys are getting attention from like hot girls for the first time. And so they ignore basic street smarts and they end up in dangerous situations. So when everyone hears that a man is murdered in Colombia, everyone assumes he got a prostitute because, by the way, um, prostitution is legal in Colombia. And I didn't know that. I know. Or they assume that it's like a bad first date turned crime ring, right? Like they think like some guy came over and he got a hooker or he got some cocaine or he went on a Tinder date and like did something stupid and that led to his demise, which honestly happens all the time in Colombia. But the case that we are talking about today is different. I think from the headlines, everyone assumes that the man we're talking about today was just a passport bro. And in many ways, he was. He was a mature passport bro in many ways. But he wasn't looking for a prostitute. This case is much deeper than a one-night stand. Divorce is hard, especially when you've been married for over a decade. You are literally leaving an entire life behind, an entire part of you. And when you jump back into the dating pool, you're like, Tinder? Chivalry? Sex before marriage? Like, what's the protocol? You've got a lot to learn. But also, the idea of feeling young and in love again, well, that's exciting. So imagine how 51-year-old Tu Zhe Zhang, a first-generation Asian-American artist, comedian, and newly divorced man, felt when he downloaded Tinder for the very first time. He's like a kid in the candy store, I'm sure, but not in a gross way. Tu Zhe Zhang is the kind of man I'd be comfortable going on an eight-hour road trip with alone. He's a family man, a community man. He graduated valedictorian from high school. He went to college, and he dedicated his life towards living to give a voice to the people who didn't have one. He was actually an activist. Tu Zhe For my visual learners, his name is spelled T-O-U space G-E-R. He was actually a refugee, born in Laos in 1973, and was one of 11 siblings. When he was two years old, his family fled to a refugee camp in Thailand, where they lived in hardship for four years. So Tuzer lived there with his parents until he was six years old. And then his entire family fled to America during the Vietnam War And they were suddenly free. They relocated to St. Paul, Minnesota. Imagine going from Laos to Minnesota and were granted American citizenship. Um, Honestly, I could go on and on about Tujer's activism. Um, He was really a proud, he was from the Hmong tribe, you know, Hmong, Hmong people. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, in murder documentaries, when the narrator says something about someone who died, like he lit up a room. When he walked in, 
mean, he he's the life yeah. of the party, you know? Yeah. He he really was, though. You know when Tuzier arrived. He had flashy clothes, bow ties, fashion, amazing hair, and he was a performer by trade, and the world was his stage. He looked really handsome everywhere he went, and he also didn't look his age. He looked more like 40, like a young 40, even though he's in his 50s. So he's 50, and Emmy, if your friend who is 50 is about to jump back into the dating pool and you are helping him set up his Tinder, what age range would you pick for him, Emmy? Um, he's like, if he's like in his 50s, like 38 plus. At that age, maybe a 10-year gap isn't that big of a deal, but definitely uh-huh. it's I, someone like okay. around his stage of life, you know? I agree. Okay, so keep that in mind as we go on with this story, okay? Okay. <laughs> okay. So you see, Tujer, he always loved to travel, but usually with his ex-wife. And now he's single and he needs a travel companion. So post-divorce, he continued his travels around South and Central America and he utilized the apps in his phone, Tinder, to be exact. From Tujer's social media posts, we can see these Tinder girls. He's like documenting his travels and the ladies he meets along the way. And these Tinder girls in Latin America, they see a flashy Asian American man with designer sunglasses, really nice teeth, living the jet set lifestyle. He's flashy. And that's not good. Of all the places he traveled, his favorite place that he kept returning to was Colombia, particularly Medellin, Colombia. The weather, the dancing, the women. Tujer was actually a really good dancer. He could do like bachata and salsa and like, that's very sexy. Um, But speaking of Medellin, for people that aren't too familiar, if you go on one of my favorite websites, back when I was a full-time digital nomad, I use this all the time. It's called Nomad List. You'll see on the front page of this website, that they rank the best cities in the world for digital nomads or remote workers or just slow travelers in general. When I'm looking for safe areas, I go on nomad lists and just find like safe countries. So on this list, you immediately see Bangkok and Chiang Mai, Thailand at the very top. P.S. Get our Thailand travel guide on Amazon. (laughs) And you see other cities that we write about too. Seoul in South Korea, Mexico City, Tokyo, all of them ranked by safety. Wi-Fi access, cost of living, etc. Coming in at number 54 is Medellin, Colombia. And I know 54 sounds low on the list, but it's actually a pretty good ranking because this list is huge, covers the world. So in terms of how livable this city is for laptop workers, Medellin ranks higher than Phuket, New York City, London, Paris, Playa del Carmen. So Medellin has amazing scores for its cost of living. You can live there on just around $1,400 a month US. It has great scores for internet speed, great scores for weather. They've got great hospitals, accessible healthcare. It's very walkable, LGBT friendly, and has wonderful nightlife. Medellin is kind of like LA in terms of glamour. Lots of fashion, lip fillers, big butts, you know, in certain neighborhoods, of course. Do you know like Colombian jeans are a thing in Latin America? Okay. Colombian jeans, uh, jeans colombianos, they're kind of like this super tight skinny jeans that have kind of like padding in the butt. So they give you like a fake butt. So they yeah, that's fake- like the kind of culture. They have fake butts and they're like, they sell them in some places in Mexico <gasps> and they're like Colombian fashion, Colombian jeans. Honestly, that sounds really comfortable. So you just walk around with like a cushion in your pants? Kind of, yeah. I love that idea. I love Colombian jeans. Get me some Colombian jeans for Christmas, okay? I'll wear them. Okay. (laughs) Okay. So yeah, it's easy to understand why Medellin has exploded as a digital nomad hub in the past few years because it's exotic, but still familiar. It's an adventure, but affordable. If you're making U.S. cash, of course, it's very affordable. You can make local friends and traveler friends. So it's whimsical, but it's familiar. So if this city is so damn great, why isn't it closer to number one on the list of best destinations for nomads? Well, there is one category in which Medellin has terrible scores. Emmy, can you guess what that is? I would think safety. It's safety, yeah. And for once, it's not us women that have to be afraid. It's the men 
who are in the most danger in Medellin, Colombia. As I mentioned, Tujer, he was one of eight men that died in Medellin between November 1st and December 31st in 2023. This is very recent. It's very fresh. This is very new. But people are still going there. And because, listen, women aren't dying in Medellin. It's men. So I'm about to make um, a, a blanket statement, make a stereotype. Hate me if you want to for it, but it's true that some men, not all men, but some men are going to Colombia for the wrong reasons. They're going for sex and they're going for cocaine. Some men are coming to Colombia for prostitutes because, as I mentioned, prostitution is legal in Colombia. And I'm sure that a bunch of men know that too. I'm sure they researched that one. But some men come to Colombia not to date sex workers. They come to Colombia to get on Tinder, to talk to a girl, a beautiful girl, who is actually, okay, so they think that this is just a normal girl, right? But a lot of these girls on Tinder, it's become such an industry that they're actually criminals working in organized crime. So this woman gains the trust of the man, the tourist, the foreigner. They go out she's hot. He thinks he's going to get laid. He goes back to her place or his, he gets drugged and then the crime escalates. So when you look for trouble, you find trouble. I am fascinated about the story, honestly. Mm. I am, I am not surprised that men are not researching this because men having to research a safety issue is new. In general, if these men started researching, this is how they would see. This is the most common dating crime. I'm going to break it down for you how it goes. There is an accessory that these criminals use that is specific to Latin America, and it is Colombian jeans. It's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Mija! <laughs> no, it's, it's what they keep in the Colombian jeans. No. It's actually a drug that these women use, and it's not the butt. It's not their butt. So a woman goes on Tinder, and if she's part of organized crime, she will drug a man with a drug called scopolamine. This drug knocks them out, and she robs them. So mm. scopolamine, there's been like vice documentaries on this drug. They call it devil's breath. It's an odorless powder, which many victims say puts you into like a zombie-like state. And when you watch Vice and stuff, they will talk about the zombie-like state. And when they have you under this drug, they can take these guys and make them go to the ATM and withdraw a bunch of cash. Or they can like make these guys go onto their bank and, and transfer money. Like it turns you into a zombie, but you can still move. So that's why they call it devil's breath or the zombie drug. So this is the drug that is often used in Medellin. There are so many cases of men saying that they went out with a girl. They remember having a sip of their beer that maybe tasted a little bit more bitter than usual. And that's the last thing they remember. And they wake up with all of their belongings gone. And a fun thing that these girls do is that they go into these guys' phones and they delete the Tinder match and they delete the WhatsApp contact and they delete all their conversations. Like it is organized. This is wild. I know. I can't wait for a movie to, me, to be made about this. Oh my gosh. I know, right? So scopoline, scopolamine <laughs> comes from this <laughs> plant and it's called, the plant is called, oh, okay, Brugmansia. B-R-U-G-M-A, Brugmansia, I would yeah. think. What Emmy said. It's a nightshade plant with a large, pale, trumpet-shaped flower. And it, this flower, it has psychoactive substances And the plant is widespread around the country, and it's really beautiful. So you often find this devil's breath in people's gardens because the flower is so pretty. They're But super now, common in Latin America. I just Googled see, them. See, see, I told you. So now here's where it gets concerning. Criminals extract the drug from the black seeds of the plant's fruit, and they slip it into their victims' drinks. Once ingested, people can feel very sleepy and experience this kind of amnesia and hypertension and seizures. And in high doses, when mixed with alcohol, it can be 
lethal. Just to give you an idea of how serious this drugging, robbing, Tinder, swindling, Colombian jeans problem is. <laughs> Can that be the name of this episode? Colombian um, jeans. Yeah. In 2022, the prosecutor's office in Medellin, they dealt with 82 cases of foreigners being robbed with the use of a toxic substance. So that's how widespread this is. So how do these men keep getting drugged and robbed and killed? Dating apps, right? So they hunt for women and women at the same time are hunting for them, but for the different reasons, right? So they get on Tinder and then that is where trouble begins. Now, I mean, you know how the world tells us women not to dress like sluts and we won't be taken advantage of? Yeah. I have a proposal. They really should tell men, don't dress like flashy money bags and you won't get robbed. In like all the nature documentaries you watch, if you watch like documentaries about birds in nature, the way that birds even attract women is being flashy. The male, the peacock, the really beautiful peacock we see, that's a male peacock. And when his feathers go up, he's like trying to be flashy. So most males, yeah, in, in nature are flashy. It's usually the yeah. females that are like the more like the most tame looking ones. Totally. You have kind of these older men, right, post-divorce, and it's almost like in their DNA to be a little bit flashy and try and attract the pretty girls. Now back to Tuzier. He is this 50-year-old newly divorced man from Minnesota, which, you know, I can't imagine Minnesota has the sexiest nightlife. And Tuzier, he loved nightlife because, like I mentioned, he liked to dance. He was a great dance partner. And he likes fashion. He likes being flashy. He likes explorations. So I get why he went to Columbia. I get it. I get it. I get it. Okay. But listen, just looking at Tujer's Instagram, I can see a huge, huge mistake that he is making when it comes to safety. He is in these cities like Medellin and he's a flashy dresser and he's not just a flashy dresser. He's also kind of like, he's that guy at the club in flashy outfits, buying bottle service you know, to get the girls over. He's dripping in watches, shiny belt buckles, really nice tailored outfits and teeth so white they'll blind you, you know? And I, I'm imagining like him wearing a lot of like logos, you know, like brands. Oh yeah. On- oh yeah. Oh, for sure. You nailed it. Yes. And all of the photos with him and these women, I'm, I'm just going to say it. These are the definition of big booty hose. And I say hose <laughs> because- Even sometimes Emilia and I like to dress up like big booty hoes, okay? We're taking the power back. You can be a big booty hoe. I'm not shaming big booty hoes. But on his Instagram, it's just photos of him and these girls with like their butts facing the camera in like um, almost like fishnet dresses. Do you know what I mean? Mm. Yeah, Yeah. I do. So they have like the fake butts and the fake boobs and they're wearing these outfits that don't leave a lot to the imagination. And usually the setting is in a club. So Tujer was living his best nightlife, best nightlife, you know, on Instagram, he made a post of one of his trips in 2022. And it said, in the case that I get kidnapped, don't look for me. I'm happy. Oh, if only he knew how eerie that post would soon turn out to be. I get compliments on my jewelry all the time. So here's my secret. I get my diamonds and gold from Costco and everything else I get from D. Louise. At all times, I am wearing at least two to three D. Louise pieces because guess what? They are waterproof, sweatproof, and tarnish proof. You can shower with your D. Louise jewelry, swim in the ocean, go to the gym, spray it with perfume, and these are pieces that will not lose their gold shine. For me as a traveler, I leave my expensive jewelry at home when I take a trip, but I still want to wear sentimental pieces and look stylish, especially if I'm going to be in Bali for six weeks or in Thailand for a long time. I want to look cute, but I also don't want to take the risk of having really expensive jewelry stolen. So D. Louise is the perfect balance. Their jewelry is high quality and gorgeous, but I can afford to buy it for myself. 
So yes, don't travel with expensive jewelry, but also don't waste your money on like gold covered silver pieces that tarnish over time. Get pieces that mean something to you. I always like to attach a little celebration or memory to a new piece when I buy it for myself. So start your travel jewelry capsule collection at d-louise.com and use code true crime travelers for 15% off your first order. Single, happy, and in Colombia, surrounded by women, Tujer was bound to fall in love. And he did. Now, Emmy, remember when I told you to pick the age range that's appropriate for a 50-year-old man? Now, let's play again. What is the most inappropriate age? Like, literally the most inappropriate age. Underage. No, don't worry. I'm not going to take you down the lane. But the girl that Tujer fell in love with is a 19-year-old girl. Barely legal. Barely legal. A 19-year-old Colombian girl. He meets oh, this no. girl. Her name is Sharit Martinez. She has got... I'm just, just, let me just describe her to you, okay? She's really pretty. She looks like an Instagram baddie. You know, just perfect yeah. makeup, nose. Her eyebrows are gorge. She has well, this, Colombian like, women are gorgeous. Like, that's oh why my they God. always win Miss Universe. Oh, <laughs> That's true, right? Her hair is dyed bright red, like an overly ripe cherry tomato. But somehow this girl pulls it off. Like, this girl's hot. So she's a gorgeous girl. I get it. You know, he's 50. It's probably not like, you know, the most ethical thing, but it's fine. So uh, Tujer spends a lot of time with her in Colombia. And there's one date that they went on together where they took a lot of photos together and they're just hiking. They're just actually out hiking in workout clothes, really down to earth girl stuff. But Sharit still looks pretty. And they go out dancing together where Tujer would almost see more in his element than her. Like he'd be taking videos and him like spinning her on the dance floor. And she's just kind of like uncomfortable, you know? Mm -hmm. And, um, but from an outsider's perspective, this looked like a sincere friendship, or maybe a blossoming blossoming romance. It seemed a little unbalanced, you know? Yeah. And it's un- and it is unbalanced because, you know, what do you think a 19-year-old girl wanted with a 50-year-old American man? She probably wanted a sugar daddy. And a sugar daddy is probably a better way to describe this than like a John who just is with someone one night because Sharit and Tujer, they're not just out on one whimsical weekend in Medellin. They have been getting to know each other for seven months. He's he's known this girl for seven months. Okay? So she has spent seven months, like, gaining his trust and getting to know her, you know? And I'm sure that he, that made him feel comfortable. I'm sure that made him be like, if she's going to be sketchy, she would have done it by now. Like, I can trust her. When he's not in Colombia, the two text and call. And, you know, when I met Tim, my boyfriend, We went long distance for a month and he called me every night when I was living in your house in Mexico. And in the mornings, your mom would say, I heard you giggling again last night on the phone, you know, (laughs) like phone, phone conversations because we're like, so like Instagrammy feel intimate. So Mm -hmm. Sharit and Tujer, they were on the phone a lot and over seven months, their relationship got deeper. Tujer started opening up to her. He told her about his life his lifestyle, he probably began talking to her like a partner would, maybe even promising yeah. her a comfortable life, right? So mm-hmm. Tujer kept returning to Colombia to see Sharit. He would take her out to dinner. He would take her to concerts, calling her his girl on you know his streams or whatever. And he'd be showing her off on social media, or at least trying to show her off. It always seemed like Sharit didn't want to be on camera, you know? But mm-hmm. she's like, Hey, like I'm with this dude, he's buying my dinners. And so I'm going to like, just kind of smile. But, you know, on his videos, he'd be like, look at my hot girl, but he never said girlfriend. So I think he was courting her. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, any, there's something that a woman can spot in another woman. I think any woman above age 18 can spot this when they look at another woman's face and they can see she's faking the joy. It's like when you're smiling by squinting your eyes and pursing your lips rather than like the real smile. And I see it. I see that. And I'm not going to lie. It starts getting a little bit embarrassing because 
he looks like a dad. Like he's wearing visors and you see him dancing he's with his what? shirt tucked in. Visors, like those vi- oh. they're like hats with a mm-hmm. brim. And he's standing next to Sharit, who looks like a TikTok baddie who's wearing like athletic gear all the way up her butt cheeks. And so next to each other, he does look old. He does. While Tujer might be thinking that he's planning to win her over, Sharit is also planning something. But what she's planning is much more sinister. The best thing you can do when traveling is to make a local friend. A local friend will unlock levels of life that most tourists never get to experience. So when I go home to Mazatlan with Emmy, like I get to do Mazatlan away from all the beach resorts. I get to do like cool Mazatlan, right? So when you have a local lover that invites you to her neighborhood for food, you go, you go without question, right? Like you trust your, your lover. So on December 10th, Sharit invited Tujer to an area of Medellin called Robledo, Robledo, a local neighborhood where she lived. And she was like, hey, come get some food with me. That's normal. And he was just was like, yep, be right there. Probably just didn't think about it. He also probably was like, she wouldn't send me to a dangerous place. Like, this is my friend. She's gone. Honestly, me. after seven months, kind of yeah. together-ish, talking. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, if someone spends, like you said, if someone spends time on the phone with you, that's big because people don't do phone, like don't people do calls don't anymore. People don't do that anymore. Right. And then, so they got food in her neighborhood. He's probably like, oh my God, this is like a new level. Afterward, Sharit invited Tujer back to her apartment. It was, it was finally going to happen, you know, after seven months of talking and maybe this is, you know, where they're finally going to get intimate. And he was so excited that he didn't realize and didn't research that the neighborhood that he was in, Robledo, is the second most dangerous neighborhood in Medellin. It's like the hornet's nest of organized crime. But listen, even if he knew, he might have risked it to get laid. The tension is so strong. Maybe you would do it, right? Men. Men. So after the dinner, the two of them head back to Sharit's apartment. I wonder if they were kissing in the taxi. I wonder if Tujer was more than eager because he thought, you know, this was finally going to happen. So he's in her apartment and she pops around the corner for a minute for some privacy. Was she changing into something sexy, pouring some wine perhaps? No. Instead, Sharit doesn't come back. Instead, suddenly standing in front of Tujer are three large Colombian men with guns. No. Tujer, yeah. Tujer knows he's in trouble. What do the men want? Money. Of course, right? They are holding Tujer for ransom. And Emmy, this is where the questions begin for me. Immediately, I need us to put on our detective hats as I explain this to you. As I explain this to you, I need you to help me figure this out. Is it that time already? So soon? It's that time already. It is time to play detective. Tujer is in Sharit's apartment, realizing that he's been set up, that the woman he's built a bond with over the last seven months was a snake all along. These three men are now holding him at gunpoint, and they aren't going to let him go until they get the money. Now, here is where this gets weird for me, Emmy. They're holding Tujer for ransom. How much money do they want, you ask? 50000 A million? No, no. They want $2,000. He could pay that right now. That He could literally go to the bank and pay that money right now. That is exactly my issue. Tujer could say, like, my dudes, take me to an ATM. Or, like, give me your laptop and, like, I'll transfer you the money. Like, no problem. Everyone calm down. We're all good. That, that would have been so much easier than a ransom. Mm-hmm. So less complicated. Mm-hmm. And that's precisely my point. So they go to this extra step to stage a date oh, and an ambush and a ransom. And they, right? I mean, that's just weird. If it's you weird. wanted, If you wanted $2,000, just a- ask him for it. Like if this girl was like, oh, 
Tuzier, like I'm in so much trouble. I have a debt that I'm going to pay. I have to pay and I need help paying it or something. He would have gotten the money. Yeah. Like it honestly sounds like this girl had poor Tuzier wrapped around her finger. And Mm -hmm. if she had just asked for the money, he probably would have given her anything, you know? Right. That Yeah. No. And my other question is, why not just drug him like the other girls you told me at the beginning and just like have him go to the ATM in the zombie-like state? I know. So this is why it's not matching up for me. This is why. And, you know, earlier in the episode, I said everyone just saw this headline of Tujer and was like, yeah, this is just, you know, another another tourist that got a prostitute or a Tinder date and they devil's breathed him and then they died. That isn't what happened here. And that's why this is the case that we're talking about out of all of them, because there's something funny going on here. And no one seems to have broken this down. Of all of the articles I read, no one really seemed to slow down and be like, wait a second. Why is this one different? Yeah. So many internet articles just like Channel 5 News, and they just like copy it from their sister and, you know, Channel 5 News Texas, like that no one actually does freaking like journalism any anymore. They're just like, oh, there's another one. So yeah. Yeah. So apparently what happens next is they tell Tuzier that he has to call someone that will transfer $2,000 to them immediately. And Tuzier knows who to call. He calls his brother back in the U.S., But his brother is on a plane and he's on his way home from a ski trip when Tuzier calls. And, you know, he says to his brother, hey, can you send me a couple thousand dollars? And his brother is like, yeah, no problem. But tomorrow, the call was so chill that his brother didn't know anything was wrong. That probably meant that the kidnappers were kind of like directing the situation, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was my first thought, too. Or maybe they become, maybe they were like becoming bros. (laughs) <laughs> Maybe they were all becoming passport bros. So, but then in another conversation, Tujer called a friend of his and he did explain, hey man, I'm being held for ransom. Maybe the conditions were getting worse for Tujer. Maybe he didn't want to worry his brother, but eventually his brother did get worried. And when there were no texts or voice messages from Tujer as usual, like the normal conversations that he has, his brother got suspicious and eventually figured out what was going on. Regardless of how that happened, how they figured this out, Tujer's brother and friend collectively ended up sending $3,000 the next day, but not to Tujer's bank account. This is like the smoking gun that this was an absolute setup. They were directed to send the money to Sharit's bank account. That sneaky bitch. That sneaky bitch. But hey, whatever. Money's been transferred. All done. They've been paid more than enough for Tujer's release. But Tujer's brother and friend, you know, they sit by the phone waiting for Tujer to call. And they think he's going to call and say, what a crazy fucking story. You know, you know, screw Sharit. Or, Mm -hmm. hey, I'm at the embassy. I'm getting on a plane. I'm coming home. But instead, nothing. A call never came. His calls asking for ransom money were the last that anyone would ever hear from Tujer Zhang. You know what? I hope I have a daughter one day. And I hope that my daughter travels the world solo just so she can discover how capable she is on her own. Hey, it's me, Alexa, and I have a little message for you. I want you to remember that millions of women travel the world solo every damn day, and you can too. You're just as smart, just as brave, and just as capable as the rest of us. I believe in you. And if you stick with me, I promise that I'm going to make you the most savvy, confident traveler there is. But in the meantime, Amelia and I, we own the number one travel guidebook series for women. It's called the Solo Girls Travel Guide. It's the award-winning, best-selling guidebook series that has helped thousands and thousands of women get the confidence and resources to travel the world solo with less fear and more fun. You can find our guides at truecrimetravelers.com along with other safety resources and trip planning, support, advice, help, you know, travel guide stuff. We are so excited to help guide you into the world of solo travel so that you can finally embrace that alone you can do 
and go and see and be whoever you want. So go to truecrimetravelers.com or just go to Amazon and look up the Solo Girls Travel Guide. All right, back to the case. The problem was that Tu Zhejiang knew too much. He knew everything about Sharit, including where she lives now. And if he went to the police, these four people, who now have like a whopping $3,000 to split between the four of them, their chances of riding off into the sunset with their riches would be ruined because he knows Sharit, and then they could try trace that back to these other guys. So they decided that even though he paid, even though he was sweet and did nothing wrong, they decided that Tujer had to die. He was tied up. Sorry for everyone if you, this is hard to listen to. This is hard to even like say out loud. He was tied up. He was beaten. He was stabbed. And then his body was thrown over a cliff. His cause of death was trauma to the head with a blunt object, which is was actually a rock during the fall, which means that he suffered from his injuries for quite some time. A few days later, an anonymous call to the police was caught, was given, and they found his body near a ravine. This is so unfair, like for $3,000. It's so unfair. For three fucking... I know. So Sharid just like got away with it? Well, Sharit played the part of the sad friend, and she posted a photo of him on TikTok with like, RIP, sad faces, and that's just not enough, you know? So as suspicions grew and his community wanted answers, obviously they started looking at Sharit, doubting her stories. So Sharit starts covering her tracks by getting into the comment section with Tujer's family. She's saying things to them like, we had eight months of knowing each other. He supported me. We have almost a thousand photos and videos together. Like she's trying to prove friendship, you know, and it doesn't, mm-hmm. it also doesn't seem like girlfriend talk. Yeah. So like, were they dating? It just sounds like Tudor's midlife crisis blurred his sense of reasoning. You know what I mean? Like, or he just didn't care that this girl was with him for the perks. But now that he's dead, she is not showing like the right kind of sympathy. So we have so mm-hmm. many questions. So many questions. And Emmy, if you thought this was a telenovela already, well, guess what? I've got a plot twist for you that is the most telenovela thing you have ever heard. Dios mío. That's what they say in a telenovela. Like, okay, okay, go go, go on, because I I need to know what this twist is. Dios mío. So, here we go. I'm just, listen, listen, listen here. $2,000 feels like a lot of money. When you're 17, right? So if I tell you that Sharit had a 17-year-old boyfriend, can you put the puzzle together? Oh, of course. Break it down. So she had a boyfriend all along, but like mm-hmm. she just like kept poor toujours. To, to, toujours? Am I saying it right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I feel like I'm speaking French. <laughs> um, so she just kept like toujours like on a string, like strung him along for a while just for the perks Mm -hmm. so yeah she basically had him like a sugar daddy Mm -hmm. while having a boyfriend all along they decided they needed or wanted two thousand dollars for something and just had to like kill him guy it just sounds so silly do you remember how i said that like she always sharit always looked like she didn't want to be in the videos or the photos Mm mm-hmm Sometimes there there would be thousands of photos of her on a mountain with him hiking because that's very like plain. But when it was like mm-hmm. more romantic stuff like dinner and dancing, she would always like not want to be in the mm-hmm. video. So that tells me that if she has like very platonic photos with Tujar that she's posting everywhere and then she's trying to hide the sexy stuff. It sounds like to me that her and her boyfriend probably had a deal And this was probably in her boyfriend's eyes, like her job, like you get money from this guy and you support me too. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. But eventually this boyfriend, he just became too jealous. He became jealous and he decided to make Tujer pay for the behavior of Sharit, the behavior of his girlfriend. The plan was formulated with Sharit's cooperation. That is sure. Five weeks after the death of Tujor, the police went to get Sharit. And when they went to get her, she tried to escape from a window. But eventually she and three other men were arrested and charged with kidnapping and murder of Tujor Zhang. The 17-year-old boyfriend pled guilty 
but lucky him, he's being held as a minor, which I don't know if that's lucky him, but, and then Sharit, who I've nicknamed shitty Sharit, she pled not guilty, but she's still in jail. Come on. Uh Uh-huh. I know. And her two accomplices, get this, one was a 34-year-old law student, and the other one was a 24-year-old drug mafia kid, like a like one of the kids of like the biggest drug families or gangs or something like that in the neighborhood. And both the law kid and the drug mafia kid, they both pled not guilty. Like what cowards, what cowards. Those are like, what a random group. What a random, well, you're right. What a random group. But hey, guess what? The trial will be held summer 2024. So like right around the corner. So true crime travelers and Emmy and me, we will have updates. I, this is such an infuriating case. I feel so bad for this guy. Like he was like so trusting, like probably just like feeling in the second, like a brand new stage of his life, enjoying life, going out dancing and to all of a sudden, like feeling like he's going to take one step further in a relationship with this girl to the next minute he realized he's being betrayed and ambushed and go through such a painful death. I No one deserves that. No one. No one deserves that. This is so low, like really low. The closest I will come to victim shaming is this. He should have been suspicious about what a 19-year-old Colombian girl wanted from him. If he had read the headlines, maybe he would have been. But again, I think that he was blinded by beauty and newly divorced life. Yeah. So the question is now, is it safe to travel to Colombia? I do have to say that Colombia has a level three travel advisory by the U.S. State Department. And the only higher level than that is level four, which is like a do not travel, right? Mm -hmm. So will this be the year that I go to Colombia? Probably not. Um, I don't love what I'm hearing. However, I will say that for us women, the situation is much different. We are not the targets in Colombia. If you go to Medellin and you do your daily life and you use your street smarts and you're not on dating apps in a country where predators are on dating apps as a like, you know, validated thing, um, I think you'll probably be fine. Like, again, us women, we're not the targets of crimes in this city. And plus, whenever a string of crimes affects tourism in a city that needs tourism, the city typically goes into fix-it mode. So all of these murders have tarnished Medellin's reputation as a safe place for digital nomads who come with U.S. salaries and spend their money into Colombia, and that's not a good reputation. So the local government has initiated new tactics to reduce crime, including police sweeps to find drugs, weapons, and organized crime rings that are responsible for these murders and druggings. But I... As a solo female traveler, I literally choose my destinations based on safety. And I don't think that this is something I'm going to be choosing in the next year, you know? Yeah, makes sense. But one of my best friends, like male best friends, traveled solo to Medellin last year. And he had Mm -hmm. a great time. And he came back safe and sound. Totally. So it's just like, you know, what, what activities are you participating in? You know what I mean? That brings us to our travel lesson of the day. The biggest travel lesson is blend in. When you travel, blend in. Do not travel with flashy or fancy anything. Even some people, they'll leave their wedding rings at home and they'll replace them with like a cheaper ring. When you travel, you do not want to look rich. You want to look like a minimalist. The easiest way to avoid being a victim of theft is to look like you have nothing to steal. No name brands, no expensive looking jewelry, You want to dress like Rory from Gilmore Girls, not Samantha from Sex in the City. And the same goes for men. So girls, send this episode to your man friend that likes to travel, especially a man friend that likes to travel and date and look good, okay? Because it is on the shoulders of the solo female travel community to pass this wisdom on to our brothers in the solo male travel community. That's where we end the episode today, Em. Any last... I'm sorry, but I have to say this. Go. There's a part of me that kind of feels good that now it's men who have to worry a little bit because we do carry the weight of the world on our shoulders when it it comes to solo travel, so... We care about the safety of all and, like, welcome to our world. 
Yeah. I we'll say that with up. no with no spite, I swear. Okay. Where are we gonna go next week? Do you have another request at because you and I are we are covering quite a few stories kind of like all at once and we're watching stories grow and we're getting leads and tips. So out of the stories that we have, do you have one that is particularly on your mind that we want to share? I there's one in Panama, but I'm also thinking that we haven't done anything in Europe or Ooh, Europe. Stop right there. Okay. Have you heard of Amanda Knox from Seattle? There's a girl from my hometown that went to study abroad in Italy and it is the study abroad from hell. Oh, that sounds interesting. I'm going to wait for next week for the details, but grab your passport and next week I will see you in Italy. This podcast deals with real crimes, but all parties mentioned are innocent until proven guilty and all opinions expressed are solely those of myself and Amelia. We do our best to research and provide accurate and up-to-date information, but keep in mind that some details may change over time, so we encourage listeners to conduct their own research and verify the information presented in this podcast. Thanks for listening and safe travels. Patting in the butt, so they give you like a fake butt.